welcome to our lecture on systems change through court-ordered reform. I'm Mariette Bates, and I'm the academic director of the Disability Studies Program here at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. If you don't know about our program, we offer a bachelor's degree that's geared towards frontline workers, people with disabilities, and parents of, of, of uh, people with disabilities as well. We offer an advanced certificate and a master's of arts in disability studies, which is a critical look at interactions between disability and society uh, using a variety of lenses. And we also offer an advanced certificate and a master's of arts in disability studies uh, in higher education, which is, uh, some, which is a program that prepares graduates to provide accommodations to college students with disabilities. We're the largest disability studies program in the country. So I hope you'll take a look at our programs and the courses that we offer. This is the second of our lectures reflecting on the events surrounding Willowbrook State School. I'm gonna go back here for a second. Um, Willowbrook and similar institutions. And it's particularly timely because of course it's Disability Awareness Month. And it's also the 50th anniversary of the Willowbrook Expose and the changes in the service system for people that came about as a result. So just a bit of housekeeping before we start. If you'd like to ask a question, um, and we will have time for questions at the end of this presentation, um, you can use the chat feature to type in a question. Or if you have a technical issue, you can also ask a question about that in the chat and we will try to help you with it. So, first job I had in the disability field was as a secretary to one of the early advocates for people who were residing in New York State institutions. The man I worked for had a personality very much like Donald Trump's. He was always firing off nasty letters to New York State officials about issues in the system. And one of those officials that we wrote to was Clarence Sundrum, who was at the time counsel to our Governor Kerry, who had just signed the Willowbrook Consent Judgment. While I was typing these vitriolic missives on my old Selectric typewriter, I used to imagine what the recipients might be like. When we were writing to Mr. Sundrum, I thought, well, you know, this guy's counsel to the governor. He's clearly a wise elder statesman. And I imagined an older gentleman with white hair, maybe with suspenders, kind of like Spencer Tracy in Judgment at Nuremberg. A few years later, when I was working for Geraldo Rivera's foundation, he thought it would be a good idea to convene those who are involved in lawsuits against large institutions like Willowbrook or Pennhurst, uh, special masters and court monitors, plaintiff's attorneys, or those who were charged with other oversight functions. By the way, Dr. Friedman, uh, who works, worked for the special master's office at Pennhurst, and he helped to plan that initial conference. And of course, he's one of our valued instructors in our master's program now. Anyway, when I saw Mr. Sundrum's list on the, on, on the guest list of attendees, I got very excited and I thought, oh, oh, I'm finally gonna meet, get to meet Spencer Tracy. But instead, this very solemn kid showed up who appeared to have the weight of the world on his shoulders. Indeed, he'd just been appointed for, to a very serious and responsible job as the founding chair of the Commission on Quality of Care for the Mentally Disabled. The commission was an innovative and unique government entity with oversight over the system for people with intellectual disabilities or people in the psychiatric system. It was responsible for investigating deaths, abuse, corruption, and fraud. From its early days, the commission came to be trusted by advocates, the service field, and government too, which is very rare and is a testament to the integrity of the commissioners and the commission staff. Over the years when I saw Clarence, we would talk about what each of us was working on and what he was seeing in the system, in his role as commission chair, in his international work, and in his work as the independent special master or monitor, he surely seen the worst behavior human beings can inflict on their vulnerable fellow humans. As I well know, if you're gonna to continue to be an advocate for the long term, you need to be able to sustain two paradoxical qualities a sense of outrage and a sense of humor. Mr. Sundrum has both brought both of those to his work over the years, including a formidable intellect. In thinking about the 50th anniversary of the expose of Willowbrook State School, of course I thought about the consent judgment that was so groundbreaking. 
People often turn to the courts for remedies to situations that are clearly outrageous, but what actually transpires when the case is over is mysterious. So I could think of no one better than Mr. Sundrum to demystify the aftermath of these cases for us. Mr. Sundrum's vast experience includes work as an expert witness, mediator, special master, and court monitor for Willowbrook, Wyatt versus Stickney in Alabama, Pineland in Maine, and Forest Haven in Washington, DC. He's currently the independent monitor for the O'Toole versus Hopel case in New York City, which involves affording the opportunity to 4,000 individuals, formerly residents of psychiatric institutions and now living in adult homes, to be able to move to supportive housing with services. Mr. Sundrum has been the governor's special advisor to vulnerable, vulnerable persons to address the issues of abuse and neglect of those in residential care. He has also worked internationally with Disability Rights International to reform mental health services in Argentina, Armenia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, the Russian Federation, and several other countries. So I want to give a well, very warm welcome to my friend. Um, Clarence, thank you for coming to talk with us tonight about this really important subject. Thank you, Marriott. Uh, a, a very wise and, and more experienced speaker than, than I uh, once told me that when you are the recipient of a very generous introduction, you probably the best thing you can do is sit down and shut up because it's only going to go downhill from there. Um, of course, I don't have that option uh, this evening, so I'm going to soldier on. Um, this talk is an opportunity to take a trip down memory lane. In 1975, when the Willowbrook Consent Judgment was signed by the newly elected Governor Hugh Carey, I was a 26-year-old lawyer who had just joined his staff. It was a very tumultuous time. The nation was experiencing the Arab oil embargo. Gasoline was being rationed. Cars could fill up only on odd or even days, depending upon their license num plate number. New York City was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, and the state was not far behind. Some of you may remember this daily news headline reporting on the federal government's refusal of assistance to New York State. So when I joined the office and my boss was making assignments, he, asked, he assigned me to energy, consumer protection, agriculture, executive clemencies. And then he asked me what I'd like to work on. I said prisons because I'd been working on prison reform issues while I was in law school. Fine, he said, you can take all the institutions. So along with prisons and jails, parole and probation, I got all the juvenile detention institutions and the Department of Mental Hygiene, which at that time ran 50 psychiatric hospitals and developmental centers across the state, housing 75,000 people. And Willowbrook was just one of those institutions. And so I inherited the responsibility to represent the governor on the recently signed Willowbrook Consent Judgment. You may have heard Willowbrook war stories from other speakers in this series. For those of you in the audience who may not be familiar with Willowbrook, in a nutshell, this was a class action lawsuit triggered by unconscionable conditions in a state institution on Staten Island, in which roughly 5,000 people who were diagnosed with mental retardation lived and died. A federal court consent judgment required the state of New York to remove all but 250 of these residents into small community residences over a five-year period. Before I go further, I'd just like to say a word about language. I know we have struggled over the years to avoid hurting the sensibilities of people who are wounded by terminology, and over the years have gone from using terms like idiot and imbecile to mentally defective, mentally retarded, developmentally disabled, intellectually disabled, and to people first language. In this talk, I may be using old terminology in discussing past events. This is not done with any intent to hurt, but simply to describe how issues were perceived in the past. So this evening, I'm gonna talk about three things. First, how systems reform lawsuits are different than other types of cases with which you might be familiar. Second, how during the long duration of these cases, 
they become susceptible to changing conditions over their lifetimes. And third, the typical life cycle of these systems reform efforts and the keys to successful implementation. So let me begin with how are these cases different from traditional lawsuits? While the context of this conversation is about the Willowbrook State School, when I talk about structural reform, I'm discussing the class of lawsuits which are generally focused on changing the way in which government does business so as to protect and vindicate the rights of people who receive services from government. These could be cases involving students in special education, inmates in jails and prisons, residents of public housing programs, patients in mental hospitals, children in foster care, and so on. For the non-lawyers in the audience, it is essential to understand that the types of cases, excuse me, the types of cases we're talking about are different from the, those with which you might be familiar, where one party is seeking damages from another for an injury or a breach of contract, or even equitable cases seeking to enjoin a particular action, such as tearing down a building of historic value. Rather, these cases seek to direct a future course of behavior that is required to protect the rights of the plaintiff class. And they often prescribe in considerable detail how discretionary choices that are typically available to government should be made. They also have a significant effect on the allocation of resources between competing claimants, often for many years into the future. For example, in the litigation over the rights of residents of mental institutions in Alabama, which was commenced in 1970, the system was not ultimately released from judicial supervision until 2008. During that time, the state of Alabama replaced virtually all of its old and dilapidated institutional buildings with new and modern code compliant facilities. It later invested tens of millions of dollars in developing community services. The potential that these cases have of substantially increasing the budget of a governmental agency that is nominally the defendant in the action may lead to a less than spirited defense as the agency that's the defendant sometimes welcomes the budget increases. As I noted, the Willowbrook consent judgment occurred in 1975 as the city and state of New York were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Although there were massive cuts in virtually every area of government operations, the state made significant investments to develop community services for the Willowbrook class, while simultaneously increasing the staffing levels and the physical environment at the institution. These cases are also notable for the effect they have on third parties that are not directly involved in the lawsuit. Among them, among the impacts, are the alteration of the normal course of government contracting and requirements for competitive bidding. Effects on labor union contracts would generally prohibit contracting out for goods and services that have traditionally been provided by unionized labor. In the Willowbrook case, for example, we started contracting with private agencies to run group homes for people who were leaving Willowbrook. These cases also affect local governments and the traditional powers of zoning. In the Willowbrook case, zoning became a particularly important issue. The state was required to create hundreds of community residences to house the residents of Willowbrook. Most localities had no experience with this type of housing and reacted with fear of what this would mean to property values and the nature of their communities. Initially, some of the houses that were purchased to establish group homes were burned down before they could be occupied. Soon, zoning boards passed ordinances forbidding the location of group homes in residential neighborhoods. The state found itself caught between a federal court order requiring the development of group homes and local zoning boards that forbade their placement in residential neighborhoods. Eventually, the governor proposed and the legislature passed a law overriding the ability of zoning boards to ban group homes from residential neighborhoods. And today, there are hundreds of such homes all across the state. And in fact, it's not an uncommon development across the country. Next, unlike traditional lawsuits, where the issuance of a judgment is usually the last action taken by the court, 
In these cases, the court's involvement actually lasts longer after it issues its judgment. In Washington, D.C., for example, a case involving the closure of the Forest Haven facility lasted almost 40 years between 1978 and 2017. As I mentioned earlier, the Alabama in Alabama, the Wyatt case, which began in 1970, did not come to an end until 38 years later. In Maine, the Pineland case to close the state institution was brought in 1975 and not finally terminated until 35 years later. And Willowbrook, which commenced in 1972 and ended in a judgment in 1975, did not formally end until 1993 and is still the subject of ongoing monitoring, which will continue for the lifetime of the original class members. These are just a few examples. The court's involvement also is much more complex and intrusive after the judgment than during the liability phase of the litigation. In part, because there are much clearer and more rigid rules of procedure for the liability phase than for the exercise of a court's equitable powers during a post-judgment phase. To illustrate this, during a trial, the evidence that is produced must be competent, relevant, and probative of some factual issue that is in dispute. In the post-judgment phase, a judge is free to inquire into issues that might affect a defendant's ability to implement the relief that has been ordered. Status conferences with the court are often informal, with the attendees addressing the court freely and not under oath. Progress reports to the court are not subject to cross-examination. This informality and flexibility permits the court to keep informed of progress without drowning in legal process. So in one case, where it was clear that the state would need additional appropriations to implement remedial measures, the judge invited the chairpersons of the legislative fiscal committees to a meeting in his chambers to discuss with them the importance of appropriations to support the implementation of remedial actions. This is something that would never happen during the liability phase of a case. In addition that the, to the greater discretion the judges have in overseeing the implementation of structural reform court orders, they also have access to specialized assistance to carry out the role. The inherent powers of the court to enforce its judgment authorize the appointment of judicial adjuncts such as special masters, court monitors, and similar agents to assist the court in overseeing the implementation of its orders. So while a judge may not have any particular expertise in the management of complex governmental systems, such as a prison or a mental health system, they can find experts to help them in this work. And from much of that work, the traditional adversarial rules of litigation are suspended or attenuated. These judicial agents are often permitted by orders of reference to engage in informal conversations with the parties to the lawsuit, to provide consultation and mediation of disagreements between the parties, and to inform the judge regarding progress in implementing the court orders. Much of this work is done informally. A monitor or special master may speak to the parties directly without their lawyers present, interview their employees, review documents, convene parties meetings, engage in informal dispute resolution, and make recommendations regarding the course of action to follow and so on without any of the traditional adversarial process of litigation. Another significant feature of these cases is the prominent role played by plaintiff's attorneys in the post-judgment phase. Although there are usually named plaintiffs representing a class in these cases, the real driving force behind the litigation is generally a public interest organization and its attorneys or the United States Department of Justice, which has an institutional commitment to the reforms being sought through litigation. In the Willowbrook case, for example, it was the New York Civil Liberties Union, the Legal Aid Society, and the United States Department of Justice that were the plaintiffs driving the litigation. And these institutional plaintiffs and the court tend to be in these cases for the duration even as there is turnover on the defendant's side over time. 
Let me turn now to changing conditions. One of the consequences of the long life of these cases is that the world changes while they are going on. When many of these cases were brought in the early 1970s, there were few standards in existence to govern expectations of care in institutions. It was left largely to the community of professionals who worked in these institutions to determine what was acceptable. So it is into this void of standards that federal courts stepped in and essentially faced the task of appointing standards, of adopting standards to apply to institutions for persons with intellectual disabilities. Of course, they sought input from experts in the field and relied to some extent upon developing standards. The wide standards in Alabama that were uh, adopted by the district court order in 1972 were among the first legal codifications of standards, a lot of which eventually found its way into federal regulation years later. And these federal standards themselves have undergone significant changes and further developments in the law in the 30 to 40 year lifespan of these cases. For example, in the 1970s, the federal government promulgated standards for state institutions for the mentally retarded to receive Medicaid funding. These standards were later extended to provide funding for small community facilities. In the 1980s, a home and community-based waiver program further encouraged the provision of services in the community by creating more flexibility to support community living. In 1990, Congress passed the seminal Americans with Disabilities Act, announcing a broad policy of non-discrimination on the basis of disability in many areas of life, including employment, opportunities to purchase goods and services, and to participate in state and local government programs and services. And in 1999, in the case of Elsie versus Olmsted, the Supreme Court held that unjustified segregation of persons with disabilities in an institution constitutes discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that public entities must provide community-based services to people with disabilities when such services are appropriate, the affected persons do not oppose such services, and such services can be reasonably accommodated. You can see the impact of these changes in the law on the patterns of service delivery. Next slide. This slide shows uh, the, the decline in institutional beds in the developmental disability system across the country from a peak of 194,000 in 1967 to less than 19,000 in 2017. And you can see the concomitant growth in the number of people getting Medicaid supports to live in the community over the period from 1987 to 2017. Similar patterns of decline in institutional care can be seen in the mental health and juvenile justice systems over the same period of time. So in this changing landscape, you have cases like Willowbrook, which end in court orders issued in the 1970s that have very specific and detailed requirements that the state defendants are required to implement. I've been observing the implementation of these cases for over 40 years from many different vantage points, as Marriott mentioned earlier, uh, including as a counsel to the governor defending class action lawsuits, running a state agency overseeing the mental health system and administering an advocacy program and serving as a court monitor and special master. In looking at how states have approached the task of complying with the court orders, it is useful to think about compliance from a couple of different perspectives. First, there is structural compliance, which refers to creating conditions that are necessary for compliance to occur. Generally, these are inputs, adequate staff, staff training, policies and procedures, case management ratios, and the like. Defendants generally emphasize these types of things because they are things they have better control over. They can establish standards, they can create programs, they can write policies and regulations. The structural elements are necessary preconditions for compliance to occur, but are usually not by themselves sufficient. 
Then there's actual compliance. These are the outcomes that were sought by the plaintiffs, such as safety, protection from harm, adequate medical and mental health care, individualized treatment, services in the least restrictive environment, and the like. These are much more complex goals. They're not easy to measure, and they're subject to many influences that the defendants don't directly control or don't completely control. Plaintiffs emphasize this type of compliance because this is why lawsuits were brought in the first place. So in examining the number of cases which have been going on for a long time, it seems to me that they all run through a fairly typical life cycle. First, there's euphoria at having settled a difficult lawsuit. Everyone is delighted that they were able to find a legal solution to some thorny problem of running a mental health system or a prison system or providing special education services. There's a honeymoon period, which may last a year or two, and a degree of goodwill between the parties as the work of implementation gets underway. The euphoria is understandable. The litigation leading to these types of court orders is often long and difficult. As just one example, the adult home case in New York, which I'm currently working on, began in 2003 with a complaint by disability advocates and advocacy agency that the state was violating the rights of the mentally ill residents by segregating them in board and care homes, when more, most of them would prefer to live in the community and would be qualified to do so. The ensuing six years was consumed by legal process, motions to dismiss, motions for summary judgment, discovery, depositions, and eventually an 18 day long trial at the end of which the judge issued a 210 page decision finding that the state had violated the rights of residents under the ADA. There were additional legal proceedings about what the remedy ought to be before the court ruled in 2010 that the residents had a right to move to community housing if they so chose. The state appealed the decision. And two years later, the appellate court decided that disability advocates, the agency which had brought the lawsuit, did not have standing to bring it and vacated the lower court's decision. So it was back to the drawing board with the prospect of relitigating the case with a plaintiff who did have standing. The United States Department of Justice then entered the case and it clearly had standing, as did several individual plaintiffs who were named. Eventually, in 2013, 10 years after the initial uh, litigation had started, the parties reached a settlement agreement, essentially agreeing to do what the judge had ordered in the first place, albeit under different procedures. So one can understand why everybody would breathe the sigh of relief after this long journey. The second stage is the morning after. Like most honeymoons, euphoria doesn't last long and everyone comes down to earth. Usually 18 months to two years into the implementation process, the defendants realize that the job is much harder than they anticipated, that the crisis which created an expectation of flexibility has given way to bureaucratic resistance to reforms that had been agreed upon by attorneys or policymakers or political leaders. In the Willowbrook consent judgment, for example, there were a number of things that the state agreed to do within 13 months of a new governor taking office. In hindsight, it seems clear that the lawyers negotiating the consent decree did not fully appreciate the complexity or the time involved in making fundamental changes in public policy, let alone implementing them in a very large and decentralized service environment. As noted earlier, Willowbrook was one of 50 institutions of the Department of Mental Hygiene, and it was a struggle to give it the attention it required with many other demands of the department and the state. Recall again that the state of New York and the city of New York were facing bankruptcy at the same time as the consent judgment had been entered. And truth be told, the conditions at Willowbrook weren't fundamentally much worse than many other state institutions in New York or elsewhere in the country at the time. And in reality, not much was really accomplished in that initial short period of time. Usually at this stage, the defendants discover 
that the reform needs the buy-in by a host of people who are not covered by the court orders, the legislatures, independently elected officers like the attorney general or controller, which in New York, both are involved in processing state contracts, but they weren't bound by any of the time limits. Personnel agencies that have to classify positions that are being created, labor unions, local governments, zoning boards, private providers, state licensing agencies, and so on. And usually in this period, the first signs emerge that the parties may be viewing compliance issues very differently. For example, in a consent decree in a prison reform case, the state agreed to adopt new policies dealing with mental health services in their prisons. They thought that writing new policies were all they were required to do under the decree and seemed surprised to hear that the plaintiffs would assess compliance by seeing how those revised policies actually affected the identification and treatment of mental illness among the prison population, which of course is a far more demanding expectation. And they can be simply misunderstandings and miscommunication between the parties. In the Willowbrook case, for example, the consent judgment established staffing ratios for the institution and had separate staffing ratios for adults and children, with the latter ratio being much richer. When the state calculated the cost of complying with the staffing ratio, it used a long-standing practice of calculating the children's ratio based on the population of residents under the age of 13. The plaintiffs, however, had assumed this ratio applied to anyone under the age of 18, which was a commonly understood age of majority. They were surprised and dismayed to see that the state's assumptions were different. The difference in expectations between the parties amounted to the expenditure of several million dollars more annually, money that the cash-strapped state simply did not have. So you get to stage three of uh, re resentment and resignation. This type of divergent expectations and understandings can lead to resentment of the decree and the relentless pressure from the plaintiffs to comply. Defendants discover that the plaintiffs don't have much sympathy or understanding about the struggles they are going through to implement the agreement. Defendants may be feeling pressure from the legislature as well to account for all the additional money that has likely been pumped into their system of services. They also feel the lack of support from other agencies whose help they need, but who resent their favorite status in the budget and political process. And usually about this time, many of the key actors on the defendant side leave their jobs, or there is a governmental reorganization or an election, and new people come in who don't have the same degree of understanding of the issues or commitment to the goals of the judgment. These people were not involved in the negotiations. They may not have the same kind of personal relationships with the plaintiffs. They weren't in the trenches during many of the litigation battles, and they often wonder about their, their predecessors what were they thinking when they signed this agreement? I have to confess, when I first read the consent judgment shortly after it was signed and read the 29 single spaced pages of steps, standards and procedures that the state was required to comply with, although I knew nothing about running an institution, I too had an immediate and visceral reaction. What the hell were they thinking? Eventually this leads to more litigation and the resentment ripens into opposition uh, to the judgment. This may happen either because of a frontal challenge to the original judgment, a motion to modify it due to a claim of impossibility or change circumstances, or a motion for a finding of contempt and enforcement of specific provisions. Less frequently, there might be a motion by the defendants for a determination of compliance, which tests the differing expectations of the parties. And often this ends up with a new consent decree or a settlement agreement, and the whole process and cycle starts again. In Maine, the Pineland Court Orders of 1978 were replaced by the Community Consent Decree in 1994. In Washington, D.C., the Forest Haven case, after the initial ruling in 1978, had at least five sets of additional orders after bouts of litigation. In some cases, like Wyatt, there have been four or five such cycles over the years that the case has been in existence. 
And even in the recent adult home case in New York, the 2013 settlement agreement had a supplemental agreement entered in 2018 and a new deadline of 2023. From this discussion, it can seem that there is no hope but an endless cycle of arguments, disappointments, disagreements, and more litigation. But the reality is that these cases do end eventually. And importantly, when they end, the systems they try to reform are generally left better than they were at the start. So what are the keys to success in implementation? I like to think of the four C's that usually underpin success. The first is having a competent and committed leadership in the defendant agencies. Court orders can direct defendants to make systems changes, but it is the defendants who have to figure out how to do it. This requires both commitment to the job of reform and competence in the execution of necessary tasks, navigation of competing interests, finding allies, and sustaining the effort over a long period of time through the inevitable ups and downs. Some of the cases I mentioned earlier took as long as they did for a variety of reasons, including initial resistance to the court orders, lack of competence and know-how to implement the needed reforms. In one mental health case, two of the leaders of the department implementing the court order reforms were a real estate broker and a used car dealer whose only qualifications for their jobs was that they had run for political office and lost. But even with committed and competent leaders, the work is not easy, especially in trying to move bureaucracies to do things that have never been done before or to create whole, whole new service systems. The second is having continuity in key positions to sustain the effort over many years. George Romney, who before, before he became governor of Michigan was the president of American Motors, once commented that it took 14 years between the decision to make a small American car and when the first AMC Gremlin rolled off an assembly line. He said that that type of long range planning and execution is difficult or impossible in a government environment where legislators and the governor have to run for office every two to four years with no assurance of returning to their positions. And this is actually one of the strengths of a bureaucracy if it has competent and committed people, that the work can go on despite turbulence at the top. Third, it is essential to have clarity about how one is gonna go about implementing court orders so that all who are assigned the tasks understand what they're supposed to be doing and why they're doing it. Equally important, a good system for tracking progress should have measurable milestones along the way. Mid-course corrections are almost inevitable, but the need for such corrections will not be apparent unless there is a clear way to measure progress. And finally, it is important that the plaintiffs who bring these cases maintain pressure for co compliance. Absent this, it is easy for a bureaucracy to settle back into old habits and old practices that created the problems that are the subject of reform efforts. In most of these cases, that continue for a long time. Due to turnover on the defendant's side, the most consistent actors are the institutional plaintiffs and the judge. However, plaintiff's attorneys also need to understand the environment within which defendants are working to implement reforms so that they can be strategic in their advocacy in finding the right points of pressure for the right outcomes. They can be important and effective allies but reflexive and unrelenting criticism of the defendant's efforts can be both demoralizing and cease to have any effect. It is essential to acknowledge and applaud progress and small victories in the long journey to reform. In closing, I'd like to tip my hat to the advocates who launched these systems reform efforts and who have persisted through long campaigns, disappointments and reversals to achieve their goals. To the courts, which recognized that having rights is meaningless unless there is a means to enforce them. And finally, to the many public servants who undertook the hard work of translating written statements of rights into actual programs and services that have benefited tens of thousands of people affected by court ordered reforms. Thank you. Thank you.
We have time for questions. So I'm going to read them. I'm going to go into the chat and read them. Um, and see, whoops, sorry. Um, apologies. Back to, uh, my, I have a, a itchy trigger finger here on my computer. Um, okay, let's see if we can find some, some questions that people have captioning. ASL stuff, thank you for the event. Um, this is about. I have I have one of the questions up. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Can you do You're Can welcome. you do this, Heather? Yeah. Can, no problem. Okay, great. Great. Um, so, thank you, Stan. Clarence. Danielle asks um, whether or not there are ways that you found that work to disrupt some of the cycles that you talked about, and in an effort to to try and forgo the resentment phase. Well, and. I think if there is a uh, a good partnership between the plaintiffs and the defendants, um, and there is a, a reasonable pace of progress that occurs early in the life of the cases, uh, you might avoid that. But I think that the the environment in which many of these cases occur, uh, you know, which is typically uh, an environment where resources are scarce the challenges of reform are formidable, um, makes it difficult for, for the defendants to achieve progress uh, at the pace uh, that is required. And I think one of the, the difficulties with many of these cases is that when the court orders are issued, um, there are very broad judgments uh, that, that the states are, or, or in local governments are required to meet rather than having fairly specific and measurable goals that uh, bear some reasonable relationship to their ability to implement it. Um, and I think that the essential dilemma is, you know, does a federal court want to micromanage what the, the state agency is doing by breaking up the tasks into uh, such uh, uh, minute uh, but specific requirements or does it want to leave them some flexibility in how to implement the court orders to achieve a particular goal? But with that flexibility also comes ambiguity about what is actually required. So it's, it's a difficult dilemma. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we have, oops, sorry, someone just looked right past. Um, another question, and this is, how do you manage expectations but not lose hope when court ordered reform takes such a long time? And I think for people working in the field, this is a really important piece. Uh, I, and that's an excellent question. Um, and, and I think one of the one of the keys, and I, I sort of alluded to it, is, is that you have to have some you know milestones of progress. You know, when, when you have a case which has got to be implemented, well, take the New York adult, adult home case that has an initial five-year goal to achieve uh, the, the transition of a class of 4,000 people and, and a subset of those who might want to move. It's important to have some milestones of what, what can you really expect to have happen in year one and year two and year three and year four. Uh, if you don't have those, uh, it's you know, procrastination is, is a real uh, human failing. And there's a real tendency to, to procrastinate difficult work somewhere down the line, uh, probably with, uh, um, you know, an understanding in the back of your head that, you know, when year four comes along, the, the key people are no longer going to be there to be accountable for what did or didn't happen. Um, so I think having a work plan that has reasonable milestones to measure progress and that is geared towards getting you where you need to get by the deadline uh, is, is critical. Thank you. I, I think that's a really good point. Mariette, did you have anything you wanted to follow up with? You know, I was wondering, Clarence, you know, why it was like one of the first of these cases and it took to some extent the longest. Can you say a little bit about why that was? Uh, well, that's that's also a great question. I mean, <laughs> why it was one of the earliest cases, and in 1970, it was initially filed, I think, uh, in in 1970, and and it wasn't. Uh, 
it wasn't spurred on by any notion of the rights of residents who are living in these terrible institutions. The case was actually instigated by employees of these institutions who were threatened with the loss of their jobs because there was a budget problem. And they knew they had no constitutional right to employment. But if they could make an argument that their absence affected the rights of residents, then they could make an argument that there are that the residents have rights, even though the employees don't, but the employees presence is necessary uh, in order to vindicate those rights of the uh, of the residents. Uh, so that's that's one issue. The, the second thing is that at the time this this case was brought, um, you know, that there were no accepted standards for what an institution for people with mental retardation, which is the terminology used at the time, uh, what the what the expectations should be. Uh, the, the, the same thing happened with the mental health uh, institutions. And in fact, uh, the psychiatric hospitals in, in Alabama, many of them were fully accredited by the Joint Commission at the time. Um, because of this lack of specificity of standards. And I think the the gulf between what the either lack of standards or the minimal standards allowed and the impact on patients who were suffering from, uh, you know, grievous injuries, un unnecessary deaths, uh, you know, there was a degree of violence in those uh, facilities which uh, harmed uh, patients. I mean, those are things that uh, you know, the judge was grappling with what, what are the standards and, and where do I draw them from? You know, I'm basically trying to come up with a set of standards that would prevent this, but what's the source of authority for it? We had another uh, question come in, and this is, this is kind of an interesting um, aspect to this. Are there any watchdog groups um, that folks should keep in mind that actually track the progress of some of these lawsuits and give updates and reports as to where standing, where things stand with a particular case? Uh, well, the, there's two parts to the to the question you ask. Uh, one is, is yes, I mean, in many of these cases, when, when the judge issues these types of orders, uh, he also appoints a court monitor or a special master. Uh, and, and that's the kind of work I've been doing for the last several years in the New York adult home case. And I file at least an annual report with the court about progress uh, or lack of progress and, uh, you know, additional reports as, as they are necessary. So in most of these cases, there is some kind of a, a monitoring body to report back to the court. Uh, the, the commission that I ran in New York was the state's, New York state's uh, uh, initiative to create a, um, a monitoring body, an independent monitoring body over its uh, mental institutions unrelated to any litigation. So it was an initiative that the governor took, realizing that there's vulnerability here and that the state ought not to be relying on federal courts to uh, to tell them you know what what was going on in these institutions, but to have an agency responsible for doing that. And I did that work in, in New York State for 20 years and I, and I think uh, several other states have tried to uh, create some similar capacity. The federal government passed a law requiring every state agency, every state to have an independent protection and advocacy agency to provide um, uh, oversight and advocacy to institutionalized populations and other people who are at risk uh, in, in both mental health and developmental disabilities facilities. So there is some kind of monitoring capacity, although honestly, their ability to do this work varies tremendously from state to state. Thank you. Um, we do have another question in the chat from Tracy, and I'm going to I'm going to read this because it's a little long. Um, you mentioned limited resources, for example, in New York City um, with budget problems, that these limited resources can be a barrier to implementation. So Tracy is asking, were all institutions across the country facing a similar budget scenario um, or were there any outliers? Well, during the, the 1970s uh, and well into the 80s, uh, you know, Willowbrook may have been a somewhat uh, more extreme situation just because of the size of the institution. I mean, 5,000 people in one place uh, is, is really an extraordinarily large institution. Uh, 
But if one were to look across the country during the same period, you know, institutions across the country uh, were plagued by the same uh, problem. Uh, of uh, a lot of people uh, who were essentially abandoned to these institutions, uh, state governments which bore uh, the, the cost of running these facilities did not allocate many resources to them. Um, and the conditions in these institutions in, in state after state were pretty much the same. Penhurst in Pennsylvania, uh, the white in the institutions in Alabama, Pineland in Maine. Uh, I mean, you can go, you know, through the the list, and you'd find the same problem. Just give me, let me give you one statistic to illustrate this. When we had five thousand people living at Willowbrook, there were fifty nine nurses to take care of all these people, and these are uh, this is a population which, because of physical disabilities, have significant medical issues that affect them. The incidence of epilepsy, for example, is very high. But the state of New York allocated virtually no medical um, resources commensurate with what the need was. And even when Governor Rockefeller uh, embarked upon a, a program of building new institutions, they spent a fortune building the new institutions, which the construction trades were very happy with because it created construction jobs. They didn't allocate money to provide commensurate services to the people who lived there over the years and you know much of what happened at willowbrook happened during the years that rockefeller was the governor of the state of new york okay we've had a couple more questions come in um let me start first with laura um so laura wants to know whether there are any lawsuits um that you can talk about that are on the horizon and she's thinking specifically of accessibility of housing for a population with IDD? Um, well, you know, the legal landscape has changed tremendously uh, over the years. Uh, you know, we've just recently uh, witnessed the confirmation hearings for uh, Judge uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. Uh, and you, you see the, the battles over the federal judiciary and, and they're replicated uh, in, in the lower courts as well. And, and one of the, the things that has been happening as the control over the courts has shifted from, you know, the, along the legal spectrum is the ability to bring class action lawsuits has been sharply curtailed. And it's, it's really not practical to do this kind of litigation on a person by person basis. The, the uh, legal resources required and the cost uh, of maintaining these kinds of lawsuits is prohibitive. And the only way they make any sense is to be able to do a class action lawsuit. It's much more difficult today to initiate a class action lawsuit than it was in the 1970s and 80s, um, which is not to say that people aren't doing them. It's just much, much harder uh, to do it today. Uh, and, and the federal courts are much more hostile to class action lawsuits than they used to be. Okay. See, um, Carrie has a question. You mentioned the zoning issues that were prevalent in the Willowbrook case that led to the inability to build group homes in residential neighborhoods. Um, so she's asking, did other states feel the repercussions of this particular outcome? And what was the alternative for patients at Willowbrook? Um, I, I, I don't know a, a lot about zoning issues in, in other states. Um, what happened in, in New York is um, uh, we passed what was called a site selection law, uh, which I had a hand in writing uh, while I was working for the governor. Um, and essentially what that law did is it took away the power of zoning boards to zone out group homes by declaring that these, these group homes were essentially like single family homes and could be located anywhere that a single family home could be located. Um, it did create a process for local governments to propose sites that would be acceptable so there wouldn't be a fight over it. Uh, but as one might imagine, when local governments were given that option to propose sites, they would find uh, sites that nobody would want to live near, um, you know, like in an industrial area or, you know, by a, a garbage dump or, you know, some other undesirable location. Um, so eventually what, what became essential was the ability of the state 
to locate uh, group homes, um, you know, where, where people could live normal lives and participate in the life of the of the community. Uh, and today, I mean, all across New York, we have group homes in, in uh, every locality. There were some areas of the state that actually welcomed the idea of having the state locate, particularly state-run group homes, uh, because what they found is that, you know, when you had an institution near your community, the state did all the purchasing, the state, you know, bought food in bulk and they shipped it in there. When people lived in group homes in the community, they shopped at local grocery stores, they went to the local bowling alley, they went to the movie theaters, they used the local resources. And it was good for the local economy to have these folks uh, living there and also the employees who, who worked there and brought you know, salaries into the, the community and they expended it on restaurants and the things that people spend money on. I think we've got time for one last question. Um, and Lynn, Lynn has an interesting question about uh, differentiators between PNA programs. Um, so she wants to know if in terms of determining the stronger versus the weaker PNA programs, do you find is that associated strictly with fiscal effort? Or are there, in your observation, other differences like openness of the state's politics to equity demands or presence of a lawsuit or any other factors? Um, I don't think money is determinative. Uh, I mean, in my experience, the difference between a good program and a not so good program is always the people. And a lot of it has to do with the leadership uh, and their ability to think strategically. Uh, and sometimes just to have the courage to take on an unpopular cause that you know there's going to be a blowback uh, from, from doing it. Um, there are small PNAs that have done great work. There are big PNAs with large budgets that have not been particularly effective. So uh, I think it comes down to people. Okay, Marriott, back over to you. Okay. Well, um, so I want to thank you. Thanks, Clarence, for coming. I owe you one. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you at our next event, which is uh, um, we publish a journal to promote disability studies pedagogy. And we're going to have an event where some of our authors are going to talk about their work. That's on the 27th. So we'll hope we'll come, you'll come to that. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this was a subject that interested me, of course, because I was involved in Willowbrook. But I also want to thank um, everybody who came and Heather, thank you for the and your staff for uh, putting this event together. Appreciate it.